We've been getting loads of questions from podcast listeners about how can I start a business or how can I start a side hustle? And although myself and Ed have learned loads in the process of building Medics Money, I wouldn't really consider us experts. And we really like to talk about subjects that we're expert in. So we thought, why not get along the author of the best business book of the year, who is a genuine business expert, to tell you all how to start a business. And a bit different from our normal episodes, but so much value in here for everyone who's just interested in business, right from how to validate your idea and why you should probably consider building an MVP, right through to how to leverage something called your unfair advantage. So I know it's going to be useful to loads of you because we get loads of questions about it and so happy that this expert agreed to come on the podcast. And the reason we're able to attract guests of this caliber is because the podcast has actually grown to be really big now. So we have over 30,000 downloads a month. And that is because people like you have found it useful and shared it with your friends. So if you've ever shared it or left us a review, just thank you so much because it allows us to get better and better guests on for you. Right, let's get into this really exciting episode. This podcast is for general information only and does not constitute any form of advice and tax allowances and rates are subject to change. So it is my absolute pleasure to welcome a very special guest to the Medics Money podcast today, Mr. Hassan Kuba. Hey, Tommy. Thanks for having me. So I hope that it's a minority of people that don't know about you, but you have an amazing story. Sort of going backwards, you wrote the business book of the year, 2021, The Unfair Advantage. And how you ended up here was a friend of mine on LinkedIn said a list of business books that everyone should read. And it was a good list, but there was one book missing in my opinion. So I chucked your book in there and said why I think they should read it. And then you sort of added me and then that was how it started, which was really amazing and benefit of LinkedIn for networking if anyone's not on LinkedIn. But I thought, you know, your story is so interesting. You know, born in Iraq, moved to London, a brief foray at medical school, and then on to, you know, entrepreneurship, angel investing, and writing the business book of the year. Could you just give us a bit of a summary of that amazing journey? Yeah, absolutely. So I was yeah, born in Baghdad. I came with my family to London when I was three years old. And I grew up here. So London's been my home for my whole life, pretty much. And yeah, I think the biggest struggle for me is knowing what I wanted to do. I was good at science. And I just didn't know what the career options were. Um, I think this is quite common and probably is common with your listeners as well, because a lot of us, we kind of grew up and this might be particularly true for immigrants and people from working class families, and maybe they're one of the first to go to uni or something. There's a lot of implicit knowledge that you don't get. And implicit knowledge includes things like career advice and like how things work in the real world and things to do with like getting work experience and internships and work shadowing and UCAS applications and all these kinds of things. Or even here in the UK, further upstream is even A-level choice you know, the subjects that you choose. So I feel like I had that typical mindset, which was that, why would you go to university other than to study something vocational? Because what do you do history at uni for? Or are you going to be a history teacher? Or are you going to do geography for, to be a geography teacher? Like that's the kind of thinking that I kind of grew up with, kind of, you know, subconsciously. So yeah, I was good at math, good at science. And I did enjoy science. And I thought, okay, well, doctor, I guess. You know, it was kind of, that was the thought process. I still remember one of my teachers at A-level tried to talk me out of it a little bit. Why do you want to be a doctor? And I was like, to help people. Yeah, you just the typical things. You don't, you don't know what to say. But really, it's, I think I even said it maybe at that point. I think I had the self-awareness to know that it was for prestige as well, because it's like a very respectable thing. And I think my parents, <laughs> the funny story, I can't remember if we mentioned this in the book or not, is that for my first birthday, I had a doctor cake. This is back in Iraq. It was like, he's going to grow up to be a doctor. And I don't think it was like a prescriptive thing that I had to be a doctor. And my parents definitely didn't put any pressure on me. But yeah, I guess it was like that was the default thing that I drifted into. But actually, funnily enough, I didn't go to medical school. I did biomed because I didn't have all the, like, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I didn't have the proactiveness and the advice to go and get work experience and do all the things that you need for a UCAS application. So I got my A-level results and then I just kind of went, oh, I guess biomed then got into clearing and went to Queen Mary and then dropped out after six months to my parents' shock. And I did not know what I wanted to do. I went through a period of like, what do I do next? 
I did economics at SOAS University because I thought, oh, the whole learn about the Middle East and China and developing countries, and maybe I can help Iraq. And there's a whole story of how I got in, which I talk about with Ali Abdal on my deep dive podcast with him, which is an interesting story. But yeah, I focus on all this stuff. And I think like probably people don't usually focus on this because I feel like there is a lot of change that needs to be done in terms of what we do with career. I think my careers department at sixth form was awful. At university was awful. And I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Ended up doing economics. A typical path from there is to work in the city, to be a city boy. But you know what? They'd come from the investment banking people would come in and talk about their lives there. They'll be like, sometimes we're at the office for 72 hours straight. I'll be like, why are you bragging about that? That sounds awful. What's the point of having a lot of money and not a lot of time? So I was inspired by the four hour work week, which is a typical inspirational path. I took an online course. I spent a lot of money. I saved my money from university. I took an online course and then I started my own business after a lot of struggle, a lot of pain, a lot of self-doubt, a lot of perfectionism. Eventually started my own business. It took me about two years to make it into a passive income business. Of course, passive income is not forever. You know, you need to maintain it, and keep it up. But for a time, I was just traveling around and not actually working. But good money was coming in. And it was in that time that I met my co-author, Ash Ali, because I was back in London for a time and I met at a business dinner. And I knew all about the online business world, you know, internet marketing, as it was known back then, like 10 years ago. But I didn't know about the tech startup world, you know, the world of angel investors and VCs and seed rounds and all this stuff, which I had no idea about. So that's what I learned from Ash. I became an angel investor with him because we were both at a loose end. He had just had the IPO with Just Eat. He was the first marketing director there. Huge IPO, 1.5 billion pounds. And then from the insights from that is when we put together the ideas behind the Unfair Advantage book. So that's basically my story in a nutshell. That's a great summary. I got so many questions that I want to ask. But the reason why I like the Unfair Advantage is because I read a lot of business books because I'm teaching myself how to run a business right here. And sometimes they're a bit heavy and sometimes they're a bit like lacking in practical advice. Honestly, I mean, I listen to it on Audible to start with because I've got kids, no time, and I just listen while I'm cycling to work. I just listen to it, I think, in like one hit pretty much because it's just really easy. It just flows really well. And you basically managed to package all of that struggle that led you from, you know, all through that journey that you just mentioned. You packaged it all into one book and it's a real nice mix of kind of high level think about the business in this way like do you want to do a passive i mean passive income it's <laughs> i haven't found it yet but let me know if you do maybe <laughs> you talk about that but right through to like the last bit which is basically like you know how to hustle you know how to growth hack and i love that but the kind of central theme of the book is what you call the miles framework isn't it which is that basically we all through various different reasons have an unfair advantage that is an attribute like maybe a physical attribute i think the example you used if you're really tall you're going to be a good basketball player maybe or maybe you know money as an attribute or a mental attribute you know an idea or something about you that makes you stand out as an unfair advantage and then you can leverage that unfair advantage into you know a business or service exactly yeah so the background to the book is I was very much always into self-development books. I read them a lot to the point where I think I really imbibed and bought into the whole, I think one of the big themes in self-development and self-help books is that you are in control of your circumstances. You are in control of the results in your life. It's this idea of empowering you and giving you agency, which is, you know, it's a very useful thing and it's very powerful and I understand why they do that. But I think one of the consequences of buying into that is another way to put it. It's almost as if it's like believing in nurture a hundred percent and not nature at all. You know, that's the kind of thing that you'll come away with. And what they would do in business books and self-development books is assume we all start from the same starting line, which is absolutely not the case. It's everybody is different. And what we saw the gap in and the insight was we would see all these aspiring startup founders or, you know, early stage tech startup founders, and they would pitch us, you know, it's a bit like Dragon's Den, they'd come in and it was fun and I did enjoy it, which is why I got involved in it. What we'd notice is that a lot of them kind of believed the same thing is that if they just work hard enough, they'll get there. You know, all they need is hard work and sweat. And I think 
that it's like necessary, but not sufficient. <laughs> Essentially, hard work is definitely important, but I think it's just, it's absolutely not the only variable at all about whether you succeed or not. It's not a level playing field. With business in particular, people have so many unfair advantages. It's unbelievable. And so that's kind of how it came to be. We were like, there's this X factor to the startup founders that succeed, or we believe they'll succeed, or we'll believe that they'll be able to close their round of funding versus the ones that can't, the ones that can't get any traction, can't get any belief, or can't get, even get through to the investors. And that thing we call the unfair advantage. Do they have an unfair advantage? What is their unfair advantage? We started using that framework. And that's hence why the book is called The Unfair Advantage. The idea being that just like in sport, you gave the basketball example. And I think like we can all agree and we can all kind of believe in talent and unfair advantages when it comes to things like, let's say, singing. <laughs> you know, t- is, Do they have the talent or not? It's called The X Factor, the show for a reason, right? And we believe it's clearly the case in sports as well. Like you see swimmers with their long arms and long legs. Look at Michael Phelps. He's basically designed to be able to swim really fast. And you look at basketball players who are super tall. And if you're not that tall, then you have a huge disadvantage. So being tall is an unfair advantage in basketball. It's nothing to do with how hard they work. It's nothing to do with anything. It's just genetic, mostly. I think what we wanted to say is this also exists in other places as well. We all know this. So let's not assume that this isn't the case in business. Let's not assume this isn't the case in success, however you want to define, you know, in the broad definition of success that society will give. And I think that's what we wanted to highlight. We wanted to highlight that there's different types of unfair advantages. Some people might have money. Some people might have like crazy genius level intelligence. Some people might have a unique insight that only they have pretty much. Some people might have amazing expertise and education to be able to create the right product to solve the problem in a good way. They might be at the right place at the right time. They might have the right status and the right credentials to be able to raise funding, you know, pull together a team to be able to actually create a good product, to actually be able to reach customers. All these things, you know, there's a lot of unfair advantages involved. And that's what we wanted to talk about. So we say it's a very unique book. It's a very groundbreaking book because no other business book even acknowledges that some people have an advantage over others. They just assume everybody's starting in the same spot. Okay, let's talk about strategy. Let's talk about hard work. That's it. Yeah, I love that. There's two things that stand out in the book. I think it was only like one or two lines because, you know, growth mindset, Carol Dweck, famous. And in the book, I loved it because, yeah, okay, I have a growth mindset. Definitely. That's why I'm sat right here right now. But there are limits to it and we need to acknowledge that. And so you call it the reality growth mindset, which I absolutely love because like you say, I read like the growth mindset books by Carol Dweck and you're like, I can see your point, but they've gone too far, like too extreme. And it's clearly like, I am not going to be a ice hockey player, whatever I do in my mindset. Like it's a fact. So I like that because you just called it the reality growth mindset. And that really was like the core idea in the book, really. I like it. Yeah, I think this touches on like, it's almost like American versus British differences. So self-help and self-development industry is very American. And American is also, this ties in also to the American dream. This also ties into the whole attitude that they have where anybody could do it, you know, like this whole kind of belief and even attitude towards wealth and rich people might be changing a little bit now, but still they generally have a positive view on it. And I think that comes from the fact that it's a younger country. They didn't have the established class system as much of course they do have a class system but just not as much as here in the uk or in europe in general or the old world in general there's a lot of things underlying it like that but i used to look at like really smart people and i used to notice that they weren't into self-development they weren't like into these self-development books they weren't into these kind of you could do it too kind of thing they used to be like no don't be ridiculous of course not there are limits that's the kind of things they used to say and i used to think why is that you know like why is it that they don't buy into this And then I started to look into it. And that's when I started to open my mind up to the idea of nature. One of the other things is talent. I touched on it a little bit, which is that there's a chapter in the book called, yes, talent does exist. And it's like such an obvious thing, but there were so many books written in the mid 2010s, let's say, that were all about how talent doesn't exist. Talent is overrated. It's all about the 10,000 hours. It's all about the hard work you put in. And honestly, that's just not true. Like, why are we lying to people? Why are we lying to ourselves? It really isn't the case. And yes, you know, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. But imagine if you're talented and work hard, like then you're going to win. It's very obvious. So I think this is the kind of obvious things that we wanted to highlight. And we wanted people to play to their advantages and double down on their strengths rather than just beat themselves up for not being able to succeed in 
any endeavor or any, you know, kind of industry or vertical or role or whatever it is. Yeah, I think that's so important. And like, yeah, I'm not going to launch an ice hockey career, but obviously with mine and Ed's story at Medics Money, we have a few unfair advantages. And also not all of our unfair advantages are related to, you know, I came from working class background and actually that has turned out to be an unfair advantage because I know what it's like to have £85,000 worth of debt, pay that down. Once you've paid it down, start investing and build yourself up from nothing. And so not all unfair advantages come from a position of strength, shall we say. Sometimes unfair advantages come from a position of relative adversity, in my unbiased opinion. And I'm thinking you're going to agree with it. And I know that Ash would as well, because... yeah. (laughs) Perfectly brought us onto the idea that, oh, you know, you might be hearing this and thinking, I don't have all these unfair advantages. I didn't have a rich uncle who <laughs> put money into my business. Neither do I. Mum and dad. Yeah, exactly. So we talk about the double-edged nature of unfair advantages. Actually, what can seem like an advantage can be a disadvantage and vice versa. You can turn a disadvantage into an advantage, as you just touched on, with the right mindset. And this is actually very important. And me and Ash don't come from privileged backgrounds. And that's one of the key things. I think if we'd come as super privileged guys and written a book like this and just said, yep, if you don't have it, then then tough luck. Then I think it's a very different vibe. I think one of the biggest themes was gratitude is look at what you've got, make an audit of what you have and be grateful because a lot of the time it'll give you, so let's say having less money will make you more motivated, will light a fire under you. Whereas growing up with comfort and wealth, it just does the opposite and makes you more likely to go off the rails or maybe even have other issues. So yeah, it's a very nuanced topic, but the key is that Use you as an example now, Tommy, you mentioned that coming from a working class background. So what we say is that in terms of status and in terms of all the stuff that I mentioned before, all the different types of like, you know, there's like cultural capital and social capital that you might be lacking, implicit knowledge, which I already touched on. So that's a disadvantage, right? And obviously money, like just straight up, just not having money. But then also you have the advantage of having insight into what it's like to be working class. More people are kind of scraping by than are thriving so therefore you have more of an insight into what more people think and what more people are going through you also have an insight of as you mentioned what it's like to go from debt to having more money and also it can drive you so there's all these other benefits having little money can make you more creative that's a huge one that we touched on in the book we would see that with startup founders all the time if they had loads of funding and lots of money they'd be extremely uncreative and extremely just burn through cash because they'll be like oh we'll just do google ads and facebook ads and it's like well yeah that's when you have no imagination and you just want to throw money at a problem and it's not a good way to do it. So yeah, it makes you more resourceful, makes you more hungry. There's lots of benefits and that's a huge theme we love talking about is how you can turn a disadvantage into an advantage. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. And I'd like to consider myself aspirational middle class now, to be honest, because, you know, <laughs> I'm a doctor and also got a bean to cup coffee machine so nice so do i actually recently yeah. got one <laughs> you got a pizza oven no i don't have a pizza oven yet so i need yeah. to get a bit more middle class but, yeah. yeah you're in the aspirational category with me basically once i, I get so. my pizza oven installed i'm there this is a bit of a tangent but it does link to what we were just talking about and something that i think about all the time so i've got kids right and i think you have too and Like my kids are having a really different, like, okay, I, you know, I wasn't impoverished, but it's just like a normal working class lifestyle. If I came home from school and said, I got a school trip and then my brother came home was like, I ripped a hole in my trouser knee. And my other brother was like, I got a hole in my shoe. My mum would be like, right, I'm going to go work an extra shift to pay for the school trip or iron on one of those patches, you know, like to fix Mm -hmm. the trousers that they're like a magic you iron on and it fixes it. (laughs) So like, that's the level I'm not pleading poverty, but my kids are having a really different upbringing to me. And one thing that I think that you said is that it did make me hungry. And I'm like thinking, how can I, how can I make them hungry? You know, what should I do? Mm. I'm really conflicted about it because in one way I want them to have a nice stress-free life without any of the concerns that I had. But in other way, part of that really drove me to, I guess, like want to do better for myself. So how do I resolve that conflict? That's a really good question. I'm going to have to go through this myself when I actually don't have kids yet, but soon, I think soon, hopefully, but I have already, you know, already touched on it in my mind and stuff. So yeah, given that caveat of not being a parent yet, and of course, experience trumps any theory or thinking about it. But I think the key 
is really to understand the benefits of both. You have to really look at the flip sides of the coin on both sides. So the benefits of having money, depending on what level you're talking about, like again, like being impoverished versus being genuinely like hungry and missing meals and stuff. There's different levels of here, right? But there's this idea of having a financial safety net, which is important. There's this idea of having a feeling of abundance, which also can be a bit double-edged, but there's something very powerful about a feeling of abundance. There's something very powerful about confidence. There's another model that I created. I wrote an article about this before the book was published, and I never found space for it in the book. So I'll treat your listeners to it right now, which is the three C's. So the benefits of like privilege, money, wealth, private schools, etc., is the three C's, which is confidence, number one, and probably the biggest one. It's huge. It's just this idea that, or expectation or belief that you can do something. You can get to the top of companies. You can start your own businesses. You can make millions of pounds. Or, or These are all possible. Just to have it in the realms of possibility is huge. I think there was something interesting. I saw somebody tweet a few years ago, which was a question from an Eton entrance exam. And the question was something along the lines of, there is a riot happening in London. As prime minister, what do you do to quell the rioters or something? And it's just like the assumption there is like it's normal to be PM. It's quite incredible. And obviously most prime ministers went to Eton. So it makes sense. And that's the whole unfair advantage thing. So confidence is number one. Number two is connections. Connections is huge. One of the biggest benefits to university that we talk about in the chapter on education is going to a good university and getting the connections from there. There's three benefits to uni. Again, just bring in another model, which is the actual content itself. This isn't part of the three C's. This is just benefits of you know, education. Is the content itself, which is probably actually the least valuable, <laughs> what you actually learn. In a vocational sense, maybe medical school, yeah. But even then, I think you probably learn more by doing, etc. Secondly, the connections that you get at university, which is the thing I'm touching on in this three C's model. And thirdly is the credentials. You get the signaling power. You know, I went to Oxford. <laughs> I studied medicine at Oxford. I studied medicine at Cambridge. That kind of thing is very powerful for signaling. So going back to the three C's. So we said confidence and we said connections. And the third is contingencies. It's the financial safety net. And I think it's really important to try and give as much of this to your kids as you can. But at the same time, you have to find the right balance. It's almost like the flow state. You know that well-known Chikmen Chihai or something? That's his name. He wrote a book called Flow. And I think for flow state, you have to have, find the right def level of difficulty. So when they design these addictive games on mobile phones or something, what they do is design it to be the right level of difficult because if it's too easy, it's boring. And if it's too difficult, it's also boring. So the sweet spot, that's the flow state. I think it's kind of on a macro level in your own life or the life you kind of help to create around your kids is to get them into that flow state, to stay motivated, to stay hungry, you know, metaphorically. And but at the same time, to not feel panicked or scarce or like, you know, they're in danger or et cetera. So I think that's the kind of key to figuring that out. Now, the questions in terms of like, I had these discussions where it's like, you know, if I get a business class flight, do I get business class for my kids? I've heard stories of people putting their kids in economy class while they're up front in business. And it's like, I guess it depends on the age of the kids. And I guess it depends on other things like that. But, you know, if you're going to be financially comfortable, they're going to be financially comfortable to They're going to grow up with a certain level of luxury and there's kind of no two ways about it, really. So, yeah, I'd love to know your thoughts. Where have you reached? What kind of, where have you landed on or at the moment in your idea? It's a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> but one thing that I'm trying to teach them a bit is that basically money does not grow on trees and you have yeah. to work for it, right? So they have like Lego magazines and my son loves them and they're like five quid or something. It's crazy. So he'd be like, I want a Lego magazine. I'm like, okay, it's five pounds. That means you need to, you know, wash my car or help me do this. So then he earns the money and then we go yeah. from there. And that was working quite well. But then we went to Harry Potter world and he had his pocket money with him that he'd saved up and he had about seven quid in his thing. You can't buy anything for seven quid in a Harry Potter gift shop. <laughs> and so I went a bit soft and I bailed him out to the tune of about 30 quid and it all went wrong. And that's what you're saying, the oh. safety net. Like, you know, yeah. you, if you're working class, you, you just don't have that safety net. And, and also, you, it's not like a trauma. Like, thanks to the socialized healthcare and socialized education system in this country, I did very well. Thank you very much. So mm. it's not terrible, you know, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm working for it right now, but I'm essentially yeah, trying to I teach them the value of money. I try to not 
do too many extravagant things, but we have had a bit of a relapse. We've been on some pretty nice holidays this year because obviously COVID couldn't go anywhere. So I'm not sure how it's going. Interesting. That's really cool. You know, I grew up on free school meals. I grew up, again, not impoverished. Thankfully, my parents never made us feel that way. And I just kind of thought it was normal. My state school was full of like kids from estates and stuff. I think I did grow up with scarcity. And I think that's kind of normal. I think that's healthy to an extent. If you can just buy anything or whatever, it's really bad for kids. I think it's good that they have to have some of that. But I think one big thing, and this is more about getting into adulthood and shifting from that working class mindset to a mindset of abundance. Abundance is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. There's something really powerful about thinking in terms of abundance. And it's a huge shift. So I wonder if you struggle with the same things, which is like to value your own time. And that's been a constant struggle because it's like, I, you know, as a student or growing up, you just think your time is free. It doesn't, it's not worth anything. Well, I'm not getting paid for my time. So I, I might as well do it myself. You know, that kind of mindset that you get instilled with when you're younger, which is, you know, never to really get like help with things, never to pay for things that you don't need to get paid for. Oh my God, you can save this much on this. Shopping for value instead of shopping for what you actually need. Like constantly looking for value for money, which can waste time and actually is a terrible trade-off. So that's a big struggle that I've gone through as I've become more comfortable financially. You just described my life because <laughs> I still clean my own windows. I'm looking at them now. I need to do a bit of window cleaning. Yeah. And I still wash my own cars, definitely shop for value. You know, we have Lurpak butter, which actually is ridiculously expensive. But other than that, we don't have any brands because yeah. you're just used to it. And I don't really see any reason to change. And also for clarity, like <laughs> I'm aspirational middle class. So let's not get too carried away here. Yeah. But I think another thing that you mentioned, a big thing for me that I'm trying to do for my children is when I was growing up, I didn't know any doctors. In fact, I didn't know any professions, right? Mm. So we just lived like the working class lifestyle. Everyone went to work, earned their money, came home. And no one was investing. No one was leveraging their time to make more money. No one was a professional. And so I left UCL. I did a degree first. I left UCL with a first class degree. So probably had quite a lot of options. And I went to work as a travel rep in Spain. And my mum was just like, cool, that's a great job. And like, in retrospect, you know, it was great that she was like that, but in retrospect, that was a crazy move. But even though I'd been to elite university like UCL, mm. the only role models that I'd seen, like you, were the bankers and stuff. And I was like, well, that's not for me. So instead of taking a sensible middle road, I'm just going to go to the other extreme and do a job that I think sounds fun. And lots of my mates were tour reps, you know, because that was just like right. the working class hustle, innit? Go be a tour rep and you're basically on holiday getting paid hardly anything, but having a great time. So I think that I'm trying to surround them with role models and I definitely don't include myself in that category, but. <laughs> okay, we're getting towards the end, but I want to, while I've got your wisdom here, you know, lots of doctors are maybe thinking about starting, like side hustle culture is pretty popular. And you already mentioned probably the most famous doctor side hustler that there is maybe Ali Abdal you mentioned oh. him earlier that you were yeah. working with him because you know working as a doctor is really hard at the moment and people are looking for alternatives okay and you know Ali's definitely found his niche and that's amazing but if you've got an idea and I guess this links to the unfair advantage say you're a doctor you've got an idea for something how do you decide whether that is a good idea or not? So if I came to you and you were angel investing and I said, here's my idea, what mm. sort of criteria you look for and go, oh, that is a good idea or that's clearly not going to work? Because a lot of people get stuck at the idea stage. Yeah. Okay. So before I start to get into it, I was joking around because Ali Abdal is like, especially like a lot of people I've known through in the medical community. First of all, I'm Iraqi. There's a lot of Iraqi doctors as well. So that's already a connection point. But secondly, the Ali Abdal thing, he did a review of The Unfair Advantage quite early on in 2020, and it went really viral. It's got almost 2 million views now. And he became my first business coaching client. So I was his business coach and I'm coaching him through writing his book right now as well. So yeah, that's just the background. He's a good friend of mine now. In terms of idea, how do you know whether an idea is a good one? I think it's very, very important to figure out if it's solving a problem or if it's a solution looking for a problem. I think that's one of the key things with an idea. Let's dispel some myths first, which is that an idea, people think an idea needs to be completely unique. That's absolutely not true. It doesn't need to be completely unique. It just needs to be a slightly different perspective, slightly different take, a slightly different approach to something that already exists. In fact, when something's completely, completely new, it's kind of a red flag. If somebody's pitching me and says, oh, there's no competitors at all. And you think, well, 
<laughs> maybe there's no competitors for a good reason. It's very rare that somebody does something completely from scratch. It's usually has some kind of equivalent that exists out there, at least to some extent. So that's number one. Doesn't need to be completely unique. Secondly, think of it in terms of solving problems is a really good frame for thinking about ideas. Think about what problem is it solving? How painful is that problem? Are people who have that problem out there actually actively seeking a solution? Often what happens is we see a problem out in the world and we say, oh, so many people need help with this, but it's from our perspective. So the biggest mistake is to think of something from our own perspective, from an external sort of expert perspective and think, oh, you know what? I know this space. People need help with this. So I'm going to do a business and help people to do this. Well, the problem is if people don't acknowledge that that's a problem or aren't actively seeking to solve it, then you don't have any customers. I'll give a quick, funny little example about this. I remember back quite a few years ago now, I read a book about posture. It was actually the way the book was written and a lesson in and of itself, the way it was titled is, I think it's called Eight Steps to a Pain-Free Back. And so it's titled to solve a problem. So back pain, which is obviously one of the most common problems. And it's a book about posture, right? It's all about postures, this whole idea of primal posture, you know, the validity of which, whatever, but like, it seems to be quite good. And it's kind of helped me. When I read that book about posture, I started to see everybody having bad postures in the world. Oh my God, this guy's got terrible posture. Oh my, and then friends, family, <laughs> insisting I was trying to tell me, friends, family, anyone I see, when you're, when you're new to something, you're a bit evangelical about it. Well, I don't know about you, but I am. And I was like to them, oh, you know, if you do this, you know, not always, but sometimes I'll say it to them, especially if they're really close to me or I just want to help them out. And what I notice is people will be like, sit up straight and then I'll just go straight back because they don't perceive they have a problem. They're not aware of it. They're not looking for a solution. So if I'd seen that and said, you know what, I'd do a business talking about posture. And I think the posture expert knew what she was doing by calling it eight steps to a pain-free back because it's a problem solver. That's the key. I think there's a lot of lessons in just that little anecdote. You have to look at it from that perspective. Do people think it's a problem? Is there enough of a market? Is the total addressable market size big enough? Is it an intense problem? If it's a really intense problem, you can get, it's worth a lot to solve. So you don't need as many customers and clients to be successful. Whereas if it's a kind of a smaller problem, but people are actively so looking to solve it, but it's small, therefore they'll be willing to pay less for it. The value of it is lower. So then you need more customers. The market size, like in terms of number of people needs to be bigger. Number of clients, customers needs to be bigger. So that's a good kind of perspective of looking at it. And if you are just another very related common question I get is how do I come up with an idea? A good way to come up with it is to start with who, not what. So instead of thinking of a business idea as what is the idea, think of it as who are you serving? And what problems do they have? So you can start by thinking of a particular demographic, a particular person almost even. You can think of that person as being like an avatar for that demographic and think, what problems do they have? So maybe for you, it's like medics, you know, doctors, maybe in the UK. Initially, I don't know what exactly your target audience initially was. And I don't know it's expanded outside of that. Who need help with money because that's something that doctors don't. But you have some insight into that. So one of the keys here is insight. So often when you're thinking about who... It's often good to start with yourself because you have insight into that or to start with somebody that you know intimately so you know what they're thinking. And the best way to reach them is to know what they're thinking and use the same language they use to get their attention. And that's how you get the clients. And I think sales is the first perspective to look at. How do you get sales? How do you get attention? How do you do the marketing sales side before you even start thinking about the solution? Yeah, amazing. And so much wisdom in that. Like, that's such great advice. And presumably then, like, sort of build an MVP, a minimal viable product, as cheaply as possible Absolutely. and see if it flies, you know. And definitely you will try a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff won't fly, but enough hopefully will. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so, like, you've done that. You've got the idea. You built the MVP. There is a market. Asking for a friend. <laughs> you've built the business. It's going well common errors that you see you know sort of smaller one or two people businesses make as they scale to become a sort of five to ten person business again asking for a friend if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but the biggest the most common thing and this is just genuinely just a hard thing to learn is to learn to delegate it's so hard it ties into the whole do it yourself the whole kind of almost like a working class slash growing up with you know not having like somebody growing up in a wealthy household, they usually have like staff, they have maids, they have nannies, they have au pairs, they have like, 
do you know what I mean? They leverage things. Even some of them have private chefs. I go to a really fancy gym now. And my personal trainer, we connect because he's from working class background as well. And he was like, oh my God, these guys, they just send a message to their chefs and ask them to create something for them and stuff. So it's really interesting because you have to think about it like that. How do you delegate? How do you focus on the highest leverage work where you really have the unfair advantage? Something that is the core to the business that you can't delegate away and then really try and delegate away everything else. Now, delegate doesn't mean abdicate. Neither does it mean micromanage. Again, now we're getting to management skills and hiring skills. And that's a difficult balance to learn. And you can only learn by doing, really, of like I'm being a bit of a micromanager there. I'm really annoying. Oh, actually, I'm being too relaxed and not looking at what they're doing and just leaving them be too much. And how do you even hire? And what you try and hire for is somebody who's ready for it as opposed to you know, somebody who you hope will step up into the role. There's all these different things about hiring and management that it reaches when you're at that stage of a business. Does that resonate as like, that's kind of difficult to do? Yeah, it resonates so much. And I think there's two reasons why I struggle to delegate. One, probably for what you mentioned, background. As I said, I'm still cleaning my windows, which I'm reconsidering right now. (laughs) But two, if you've built it from nothing with no funding just your own money Mm. inevitably you know at one point i was the chief technical officer the chief operations officer the chief email officer i was in charge of seo i was in charge of social i was in charge of invoicing you sort of done it all and then as you scale you can no longer do it all but it's hard to put it down because yeah you know if you've bootstrapped it you've by definition, built it from your own hands. And it's hard to sort of put things down. And yeah, one thing that we've found useful, again, you know, I used to look at business management books and just think, oh my goodness, that's so boring and not really relevant to medicine or life in general. But one of our new hires is basically building SOPs for everything. So This is how our podcast is done. It's all protocolized. So, you know, after this, you know, you've already been through the workflow. So you got the automated email, you got the sort of reminder. And then after this, it gets sent off to the editor. So you're right. I'm leveraging my skills right here. But after this, I'm not editing it. I'm not posting it. I'm not doing anything. Someone else is doing that. But it's hard to do without right policies and procedures. And that sounds incredibly boring. It does. Um, (laughs) It is. I think the key is to, and this was huge for me as well, the key is to understand that some people enjoy that. Some people really love building systems and creating the operations. And I think oftentimes the first creator, the first founder, isn't the one that enjoys that kind of thing. Hence why they were drawn to founding something from scratch, which has, by definition, zero systems, zero protocols, etc. So yeah, you know, what's interesting, Tommy, this is the thing that helped me to create the passive income business is systemizing. And actually the way I started my business is by not... This is how they taught it at first. It was like a decent course, actually, because it was like, for example, I was doing like websites and marketing, and then SEO was the thing that I realized is the great cash generator at that point, which is helping people to get to the top of Google. And one thing they taught is from the get-go, you delegate. So you get a designer to design the website, then you get a developer to then put that into code and actually put that up. And each step of the way, you give it out to somebody else and they give it to you. And then you start to put together a system. When you have that from the get-go, I think that's why... It, I was able to systemize the business and create a passive income, which again, there's no such thing as a self-perpetuating machine or something. There's no such thing as something that just, you know, continues to run forever and continues to kick off value. You have to almost charge it and maintain it for that. But yeah, that's the key. I think you're on the right track, definitely by doing that and by hiring. I think that's the biggest thing that people struggle with. Yeah, definitely. And I don't know what you think about this, right? So like I said, I did the SEO and, you know, self-taught. We were doing really well in the rankings. Now we have a team that does it for us. It's amazing. But having done it myself, in a meeting with them yesterday, they're going through what their plan is. It all sounds really cool. But because I understand it, not as well as them, but good working knowledge, they say something that they're going to do. And I say, well, we've never done that before. And, you know, why would we do it? And it's worked for other people. And then, well, this is something specific to this niche. I had some insight there, which they didn't because our industry is really niche. And so if I had delegated it, I don't know, I'm struggling with delegation, as you may have noticed, but that's just an example where I thought, yeah, I could have left these guys to it and they would have been absolutely fine. But I did feel like me being there was kind of useful because Mm -hmm. this one point was kind of crucial. And the only reason I knew it is because at the start, I think one thing we've done well is like analyze our data. You know, as doctors, we're analyzing data all day, every day, making decisions, building a business. If you can get accurate data, 
is no different. And you're just constantly crunching those numbers. And that's how we know what works. And in a way, the podcast was a reaction to being unable to scale because as you know, this just started with our friends and friends of friends, and eventually it was way too big. And we were getting so many speaking invites, you know, come and speak to 20 doctors here in Newcastle, 30 in Liverpool, 50 in Cornwall. And we really wanted to do it. But, you know, I've got a young family and I don't want to drive around the country all day. So we were like, how can we leverage our time in a smart way? We're like, try a podcast. And, you know, so this is a leverage of our time. We're speaking to 30,000 doctors right now. So no, I think you're right. Like, Delegation and getting processes is the key, and it's easy to make mistakes in that. You made a really, really good point, and this is actually a very important cautionary tale. So what I said is delegate what isn't the core of the business. And there's a very important caveat here, which is that marketing and sales is a core part of your business. Like this is what people do. They go, oh, no, let's imagine it's the artist. And they're just like, I just create the art and I leave the suits to take care of the sales. And it's like, no, you need to understand the sales and marketing side too. And SEO is sales and marketing. And actually, it's very useful to have some knowledge. That's where the balance comes in a little bit as well. SEO was actually a huge challenge for me because my clients wanted it. And I was like, okay, let's crack this nut. This is actually really difficult. And I hired and fired so many like supposed SEO experts until I actually took a course and learned it myself a little bit. I didn't even finish that course. I kind of dabbled in it. But it was enough working knowledge to then know how to delegate to somebody who's actually getting results. So yes, you're absolutely right. And big cautionary tale, do not delegate sales and marketing completely from the get-go. You have to do it yourself at the beginning. You have to understand it. You have to get a little bit good at it. It doesn't need to be like your absolute strength. You don't need to become a superstar salesperson or superstar marketer, but you just need to understand what's going on. You need to kind of get an idea for what works. It's very important, actually. Yeah, no, I think like a working knowledge of all parts of the business. I mean, there are things happening now that I have no knowledge of them. And then occasionally we have a team catch up and it's like, I've done this, this, and this. I'm like, Wow, that's amazing. And also a big thing for me was there was a point in this all. Like me and Ed love doing this and it started off as a passion project. It's grown a bit since then. But there was a point where I was doing so much and it just started to feel like a bit of a chore. And we hired some people and I'm right past that point now and we're back just absolutely loving doing it. So yeah, I think that's another thing to consider. Yeah, it goes through waves, definitely. There's definitely bits where you enjoy and definitely bits that you don't. It's just, yeah, it's a pain. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Wow. That was an amazing value packed episode for our listeners. If people want to hear more from you, I mean, Unfair Advantage is available in the bookshops. Yeah, available in all good bookshops on Amazon. It's also available as a ebook and audiobook as well, as you mentioned. Uh, and yeah, connect with me. I'm on all the socials. I'm becoming quite active on TikTok now, which is quite fun, a very interesting platform and YouTube. So that's areas of focus right now for me, but I am on all of them. LinkedIn is also a big one. You mentioned LinkedIn earlier. It feels like Instagram is maybe kind of dying, it's stagnating as a platform, but I'm there too. I'm still active. But yeah, I think you can connect with me on all of them. Just look up my name. I'm sure you guys will include some links. It would be lovely to connect. And also I do reply to my DMs. I'm still at that point where I can sort of sometimes barely get back to people. So please feel free to DM me if you have any questions, if you want to touch base. I'm very happy to chat. That is really generous because, you know, even at my super low level, I struggle to manage my DMs. So I can't imagine what yours are like. But this podcast is actual proof that you do reply to your DMs. So Thank you. thanks so much for coming on and giving us your time so generously. That was amazing. Great to catch up. Thanks, Tommy. Yeah, really fun and lovely to chat. Mm-hmm.